I'd like to welcome you all to today's informational webinar regarding UC Irvine Extension's fully online virtual teacher certificate program. We are very excited to be launching this new certificate program and would like to thank you for joining us today. This session is being recorded. The recording will be available within 24 hours. If you registered through Extension's free events website, you will automatically receive an email with a link to this recording. If for some reason you do not receive the email, you can access the recording manually by going to uci.webex.com, clicking on the Event Center tab, and then clicking on View Event Recordings. This presentation will be listed with other recordings, so you would simply need to search for this webinar's title. My name is Lisa Kotowaki, and I am a program representative here at UC Irvine Extension. Today I'm speaking on behalf of my director, Angela Jante. Here is a brief overview of what we are going to cover in this webinar session. First, I'll start off with a quick overview of WebEx features so that you'll know how to submit questions throughout the presentation. Next, I will be giving you some information about UCI Extension's Virtual Teacher Certificate Program, which is a fully online program. I will cover the requirements for the program, fees, and, and details regarding our first course in the program, which begins March 28th. I will then turn it over to our panel of experts in the virtual industry as they present the skills and knowledge teachers need to successfully teach in virtual schools or online blended learning settings. Jonathan Horowitz, Vice President of Online Education for J. Sarah Catholic High School in San Juan Capistrano, California, and Mary Keenan Asher, Vice President of Product Development at Retention Education, are both members of our advisory board and will talk about the growth of online learning and the overall movement of virtual instruction. Cynthia Carbajal, Master Teacher at Capistrano Connections Academy, will then introduce the first course being offered in the upcoming spring 2011 quarter, one that she will be the instructor for, titled Foundations of Virtual Instruction. At the end of the panel's presentation, we will have a brief Q&A session. Finally, I will leave you with our contact information so that you can send us any additional questions that we didn't address. If you encounter any technical difficulties during the webinar today, please send a chat message over to UCI Eric and he will help you troubleshoot. If you have a question for the panel regarding the content of this presentation, please submit it in the Q&A box and we will address it at the end if we have time. If you look at the top of the participant list on the right hand side of the screen, you should see a row of icons. Press on the question mark icon and the Q&A panel will show up. Please feel free to submit questions throughout the presentation and we will address them at the end of the webinar. Here is a brief overview of the Virtual Teacher Certificate Program. As brick and mortar schools face larger class sizes and fewer resources, more students are turning to virtual options. The flexible and personalized format of online learning makes it a growing field in K-14 education. To address the growth of virtual instruction, our program equips educators with the skills and knowledge needed to successfully teach in virtual schools and in online and blended learning environments. Developed and taught by industry experts and educators, you will learn best practices necessary to succeed in virtual teacher positions. Our program is designed for a number of audiences, K-12 teachers, community college faculty, continuing education or in-service facilitators, basically anybody who is interested in educational technology. In order to be successful in our certificate program, we recommend that individuals have experience working in an educational environment prior to starting the program. Students in the program must also be familiar with all Microsoft Office applications, such as Excel and Word, and should be comfortable navigating educational software applications and learning management systems.
The certificate program is compo composed of four required courses, which add up to 15 units total. To be eligible for this certification, students must complete all four classes with a C or better, as well as a completed application for candidacy form. Since there is a small candidacy fee, I would advise students to take a few classes in our program before they apply for candidacy just to make sure that they want to complete the full certificate program. As I mentioned before, our certificate program consists of four online courses. The required courses are listed below. We have Foundations of Virtual Instruction at three units, Advanced Instructional Strategies in the Virtual Classroom at four units, Performance Assessment in the Virtual Classroom at four units, and Virtual Teacher Practicum, also at four units. You'll want to pay close attention to the unit value of each course because this dictates how long each course will last. For example, you can expect the three-unit course to last 11 weeks online and the other four-unit courses to last 12 weeks online. We highly recommend that students start off with the Foundations class and follow the sequence of courses as shown on this slide. The curriculum has been developed to flow from one course to the next, so taking the courses in this sequence is beneficial. Please note that the, there is a prerequisite for the practicum course. You must successfully complete all other required courses before enrolling in the practicum. Our virtual teacher certificate program will launch in spring 2011 with the first offering of Foundations of Virtual Instruction. The course is listed on this slide with its start and end date, as well as the online course fee of $550. Enrollment is currently open, and students may enroll online, by mail, over the phone, by fax, or in person through our Student Services Office. We encourage students to enroll at least two weeks prior to the start of a course, but we also accept registration during the first week, or what we call an orientation week, of a course. Here is a proposed schedule for the courses that make up the Virtual Teacher Certificate Program. We will offer the Foundations class for the first time in Spring 2011, and plan on offering this particular course every quarter so that you will have an opportunity to start the program at various times throughout the year. The second course in our program, Advanced Instructional Strategies in the Virtual Classroom, is scheduled to be offered in Summer 2011. The third course will then be offered in Fall 2011 and the practicum in Winter 2012. This schedule is subject to change and additional offerings of certain courses may be scheduled. A huge benefit of our program is that you can earn your certificate in less than a year. Each course in our program costs $550, so you are looking at a total of $2,200 in course fees for the four online courses. You don't pay the entire total up front. You simply pay for each, each course individually at the time of enrollment. There is also a $125 certificate candidacy fee for the program, so in the end, you are looking at $2,325 for the entire certificate program. Please note that amount does not include textbooks, which some courses may require. Textbook information is posted on the enrollment page, so you'll know if course materials are required before you enroll in a class. Here is a screenshot of the certificate page on our website. There is a ton of information about our program requirements and course offerings on this page, so I do encourage you to visit it. Um, I'd like to specifically point out how to access the course schedule on the website. You simply click on the course schedule tab, and it's circled here on this slide in red, and you will be taken to the online course grid shown in the lower right-hand corner of this slide. You can enroll in the first course by clicking on the green online button. The gray calendar icons 
indicate when particular courses are scheduled to be offered. Now I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Jonathan Horowitz and Mary Keenan Asher, who are going to begin with their portion of the presentation. And Jonathan, let me hand over the presenter ball to you first so that you can go ahead and go through your slides. Great. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, it, Lisa told you how to enter the course. It's my job and Mary's to uh, uh, try to give you an idea of why you should enter the course. And uh, while I am currently the VP of Online Education, uh, for the last three and a half years I was the principal of Campus Toronto Connections Academy. Uh, and I had uh, over 1,700 uh, students in 10 counties in California. So I welcome you all, and uh, let's look at the present state of online education. Uh, when you look at this slide, this is a, this is a low representation, but what's important, for, why I included it and what's important for me is you look at the percent gain. And first of all, this is only K-12. This comes out of INACOL, which is the International Association for, 12 K, for K-12 Online Learning. Uh, obviously, there's, there's probably not a college course now that doesn't have some online component. But just in, in, in K-12, you can see in, in one year, we have percent gains of 12, 122%, 63%. .63%. These are enormous gains for any business, and it's because online works so well. I want to tell you that in those situations where there are zeros, those are states that have a mandatory cap. So it's not that the uh, program's not doing well. Uh, the states and the legislatures are a little bit in some states, a little bit behind in, uh, in testing the water of online. But then you look at some states like Ohio and Pennsylvania, enormous numbers of students are participating, as it was in California. Uh, and the reason is because online education provides a, a much needed alternative to students. At Capistrano Connections, there were many students who, for various reasons, could not get to a regular school. Many of you who are online have participated very well through, through school and uh, through the K-12 experience. Many students that we didn't see do not. And online provides an opportunity for these students to become enfranchised again and actually recognize their dreams. They can get a full, uh, full diploma fully with fully credentialed online providers and be just like everyone else. So there's, there's quite, all while doing it, 20, at any time during the day, any location, as long as there is an internet capability. One of the things I'd like to show you is, like yourselves, online professionals have grown. And just last month, they, we met in Glendale, Arizona. And this is the little blurb from the INACOL uh, press release. But it was interesting to see that uh, there were over 1,800 people sitting in the conference, and they had mentioned that only six years before there was there was less than 100. And so you're you're actually part of a very a burgeoning development, one that is employing people, and one that is again providing students with a, a great educational opportunity. Um, And by the way, the next on I call is in Indianapolis next year, and I, I encourage all of you to attend. I wanted to show you also that besides companies that I'm going to show you in the next slide, districts all across the country and the world are developing their own online programs. Uh, what's interesting when you look at this slide is, number one, the diversity of of, um, of where these students are, it, there's, a, there's a huge diversity in the number of students who are engaged in online learning. When the little icon, very quickly, if it's half a person, there's some type of uh, uh, supplemental course, as they say above, full-time is darkened. 
so you can see that you know Clark County School District in Las Vegas, 8,000 supplemental. Uh, Mesa Public School, 17,000. You look at states that really their legislature has not really um, embraced online, like Sioux Falls in South Dakota, but the Sioux Falls School District has 1,450 students last year involved in online education. These are students that require, every online course requires a certificated teacher. It requires a teacher who not only can teach content, but has the facility to be able to deal online. And the reason that we're here today is as an employer, uh, when I looked at people who were coming for, for teaching positions, online experience was absolutely put them to the head of the class. And, um, and that's what we're looking at today. So you'll see in the, the established district programs, uh, you'll see that many, many, there's a diversity of, of where these programs are, there's a diversity of how they run their programs, but I can tell you that the numbers are growing exponentially. Um, locally, in, in our area, Capistrano Unified, which was a bastion of brick and mortar, uh, came to me a few months ago inquiring about how to start their own online program. Now, the online landscape involves lots of people. And this slide, also put out by INA Call, describes some of the different components in that landscape. You notice up above on the uh, like 10, like 10 o'clock to 12 o'clock, the student management systems, you have companies that are providing ways the actual software to provide the online experience. Moodle is one that I'm sure lots of you are familiar with, as is Blackboard. Um, and then when you, when you go clockwise, you'll notice that there's content providers like Plato, like Pearson. You'll notice that it's very heavy in, with uh, publishers, textbook publishers. They have seen the writing on the wall and realize that as print materials go away, there's much more of a demand for online resources. Um, and then as you go further down, you'll notice that there's content and instruction. These are companies that are providing teachers, and this is what we're looking at. So we have Event and Apex, Advanced Ac Academics, uh, Florida Virtual School, K-12, and Connections, which I work for. Uh, these are all very, uh, very large companies that employ hundreds, if not thousands, of, of teachers in either full-time or part-time positions. In three years, Connections Academy went from 300 students to over 1,300 students. We went from about 15 teachers, and when I left, we had 60. So there's quite a growth potential. This is, we never laid off teachers. We never had furlough days and we never had anyone uh, losing pay. Um, and then as you go through, you'll also see some other companies that are involved in different ways, uh, down at 7 and 8 o'clock in Montrose and wireless generation. There's, you know, there's, there's an enormous market for online, and uh, some of these companies provide different types of services. I, do, I will say one thing, that even if they're on in, the, in the backstage part of online, they're not actually teaching, these companies like to have teachers and like to have people who've been involved in instruction, even even though they might be in sales or technical support or so on. So the teaching part uh, is absolutely a requisite, and you're in a good position. Finally, though, you know we talk about these companies and we and we've talked about the program and we've talked about costs, but this is a very human enterprise. And I brought up the slide. This is my this is my staff. Our staff picture taken recent uh, at the beginning of the year. All but ten were hired by me, and I have to tell you that for each hire there was over 200 applicants. And this these are the cream of the crop. And what they did have they did have um, they had uh, many of them had online experience. If I had someone who had online experience, they like I said would go to the front of the class. These are individuals who. Um, you know, one thing you can see is they're all smiling. They enjoy they enjoy the online experience, um, and they're uh, it, it did it wasn't enough anymore for an applicant to have good credentials, good competencies in subject matter. 
there had to be some experience where they were involved in some type of online foundations. In the past, when there wasn't an opportunity like the UCI extension program that we're describing, we looked for people who basically had particular skills, you know, technological skills. Now that a program like this is available, uh, if I were hiring, then I would absolutely look to see people who had some type of training in online. And so uh, this is a this is to close. I would have to say this is an enormously uh, growing field. It's an enormously rewarding field because, like I said, the students that you reach are are oftentimes students who are not reached by typical brick and mortar. Uh, online is the classic way of addressing differentiation that no classroom can. You can actually have students who want to go forward as fast as they can, middle school students taking, uh, you know, uh, higher level math, or in fact taking remedial subjects that they just need more help with. It's one of the most democratic uh, ways of, a, of uh, delivering education that I've seen. And it's also the most dramatic, dramatic innovations in education over 100 years. But you're in a position now to become part of this groundswell, this gold rush, and um, to continue with this then, I'd like to introduce Mary Keenan Asher, who's the Vice President of Product Development uh, with Retention Corporation. Mary? Hi, everybody. Um, and similar to Jonathan, I've also come from a previous life, in fact, several previous lives that um, relate directly to this, to this industry. And, um, I worked for K12.com, uh, some of you may have heard of that, and uh, was with them for about eight years and started up 12 virtual programs in different states around the country and have been lucky enough to see them evolve into quite uh, a large organization. And, um, uh, but in addition to that, one of the things that we've decided to incorporate into this program is um, a little bit of a leap beyond what is sort of traditionally considered online education. Um, our focus is, is very broad, and I've moved on to the next slide, and it's kind of a complicated one. The, the main things I want to highlight here are just the way that education in this area is evolving, and you know the, the many facets that you see um, happening in the industry right now and how it's um, what we're what we're calling this and what we've been referring to um, as we've developed it is is the fact that this is a movement in education. This isn't a trend, this isn't a fad, this is this is the way that education is sort of evolving. And so um, you've got everything out there from supplemental programs to full time school. You know, you've got districts offering these programs, you've got states trying to tackle how they're going to deal with um, offering online education or blended learning programs, delivery, asynchronous, synchronous, so simultaneous, um, you know, uh, separated by distance and geography. Um, the, you know, who's in charge of it? Is it the local board? Is it a university? Is it a state? Is it an independent vendor? You've got independent vendors popping up left and right to offer all sorts of, of courses and options. Um, you know, grade levels covered everything from kindergarten all the way through high school and beyond, as we know, college and, um, you know, in this industry, of course, is huge. My, my very uh, initial background and exposure to education, uh, online education, was in corporate America, which, you know, they've been, they've been doing this for years. So um, the type of instruction you're going to see and the type of things that you could be potentially uh, encountering as you embark on this type of a career blends you know, it comes everywhere from full, fully online to blending online and face-to-face to fully face-to-face -face with maybe some aspects incorporated. And so when we first came up with this concept in the program, we thought, you know, rather than just focus on your basic online learning, let's expand beyond that. Let's talk about the industry as a whole. Let's deal with um, some of the skills and knowledge and information that you're going to need to be able to be be flexible because this this is an industry that it's new but it's not new and it's it's new in the sense that it's ever evolving and ever changing and so we're talking about you know this goes beyond e-learning and into mobile devices um, and and what are the skills that are needed for that.
So to take it, um, actually, I'm going to take it back a couple of slides because, um, actually, no, let's move forward. The, so we've got um, you know everything from online learning to supplemental online programs to full-time online schools to state virtual schools to state-led virtual schools. We've also got other virtual teaching avenues to be thinking about. And um, I've worked in several startups, and you know a couple of them had dealt with, in fact, most recently, retention education, online and phone-based tutoring. That is also virtual, and um, and the skills and the and the kind of um, expertise and awareness that you need about instructional strategies and how to assess performance virtually do apply to that to that kind of a simple environment as well. Um, credit recovery programs, um, Keystone, Plato, supplemental services, um, you know, individual schools or districts that are adding uh, their own credit recovery programs or adding supplemental services, Title I programs. My son attends a Title I school, and they've just gotten a technology grant. And they're going to be, as a result of that, starting to add uh, you know, online courses to their offering. And uh, you know, so vocational education, DeVry University, you've got, um, you know, we've, we've decided to also expand into you know, discussion about K-14 to and what that means, and, and the focus on graduation rates and, and bringing kids up to speed. And if not, how do you hit them on the, on the other side? Um, language learning is another huge area that's really burgeoning in this area. Uh, test preparation, Kaplan, Sylvan, all these folks are all going on, and, and the list goes on and on about who and what and how someone who comes out with this kind of experience and awareness of the industry could be potentially um, engaged uh, in this career. So UC Irvine's uh, you know, the, the extension focus here is to really prepare you to teach successfully in these schools or in these settings that are online, that are blended, that are a combination, that are anything in between. Um, the focus is really, the, the, the program goals are really to transition um, folks in this program from the classroom to virtual instruction to, to understand exactly what that means and how to do that successfully because it can be a challenge. Um, how to use data is going to be a big theme in, in our courses. How to use data effectively to differentiate instruction. Uh, effective and appropriate use of technology because there are a lot of bells and whistles out there and not all of them are necessary. And you know what? They're going to change from day to day, from minute to minute. Um, right now, it's a little bit about um, cart um, pushing the horse or however you would say that um, when it comes to technology. Um, some of these programs, uh, you know, some of these schools or districts are getting grants or getting uh, monies for technology and then deciding, you know, how they're going to use it. So, um, you know, how do we use it and select it and incorporate it really effectively? Um, how to manage a virtual caseload. This is one of the things as a, as a hiring manager um, I encountered a lot with, um, with folks coming in. It's, it's a very different experience <laughs> managing your time um, online and working with a, a group of students online than it is in person in a classroom. And so how, how do you really manage that effectively? How do you keep your handle on that? Um, how do you engage students and their parents, you know, in, in a K-12 environment in particular? Very, very important that the parents are involved, that the parents are engaged in the process. And how do you do that effectively when you're remote, when you're across the country? Um, Bottom line is we want you to walk away with the knowledge and skills that hiring managers are seeking out. And that's the goal of the program. So it's a lot of brainstorming about really where we wanted to focus. And, and that is the bottom line. It's not um, necessarily um, how, to, how to use individual tools. You will get exposure to that, especially if you're new to it. It's going to be a great experience in seeing how those things are used actively by experts in the field. But um, it's beyond that. It goes into how do you adapt to this environment? How do you prepare yourself to be able to work in a very um, uh, changing environment? So um, the, the program benefits um, that really kind of bubble to the surface for us are that we've got this fantastic tool, first of all, that we were able to work with to deliver this program. The board was very excited to, to have UC uh, Irvine Park you know, partner with us, initiate it, and push this along because the reputation is phenomenal. 
Um, we've got folks who are going to be delivering instruction who are actively working in the field. Um, that's going to be absolutely key to um, keeping folks abreast of kind of what the latest and greatest is and, um, you know, get from the front lines exactly what it's, what it's looking like out there. Um, the, the advisory committee is made up of folks like Jonathan and I and uh, others who have a lot of years' experience in the field and who have seen it evolve and um, we're directly from the industry. So, um, you know, guidance on, on exactly where we're headed with the program now and as we, as we move forward, as it evolves, is, is coming from a very solid group of people. Um, and then the final, you know, piece that really stood out for me and that I think um, we all agree is, is, again, one of the biggest differentiation factors in our program is that we've got a very broad and evolving definition of what we call online learning. Um, it includes hybrid models um, because that's a critical component. I'm, you know, working at K-12, one of the biggest requests that, um, uh, that we're starting to get over there is, is um, individual schools and districts saying that, you know what, we're, we're, uh, you know, we're looking for your support in developing our own program. We don't want necessarily to have you come in and do a turnkey solution like you've done in the past. We want to develop it. We want to, you know, incorporate it into our classroom model. So hybrid, blended, however you want to call it, we're going to be bringing it into, into play when we go through this program. And then last, I just wanted to kind of cover, and actually before I do that, Jonathan, did you have anything to add to the last few kind of slides I jumped into? Uh, I, I, just, I just think, like you, uh, like Mary, is just that the, um, I, I, I just concur with you at every point that the opportunities are limitless. I really see in dealing with people that they, that were in the, people are getting it, turnkey operation that includes teachers and everything else. Otherwise, otherwise, they're asking for the blended model, like you said, where teachers are teaching part in their, partly in their classroom and having students be online because the people are demanding flexibility and um, you literally can, t everyone has a little bit, it's like, it's like buying custom clothes only. Uh, and um, I see the, mar the market out there and the demand for that is, is just increasing exponentially. Okay, and um, so in terms of the uh, course previews, um, we've talked a lot about kind of what they are, but let me just give you a, a, a sort of really high level sense of some of the objectives that we're trying to achieve through these courses. Um, and I won't spend a lot of time on foundations because, I, in fact, I, I won't talk about that at all because Cindy's got to go into a lot of, uh, Cindy's got to go into a lot of detail on that. So um, I'm going to skip to the advanced instructional strategies in the virtual classroom, performance assessment and the practicum, and just to give you a, a sense of things, um, beyond just developing a sense of, you know, foundation of the history and evolution of virtual instruction, um, you know, when we get into instructional strategies, we're going to be really digging into some of the, some of the best practices uh, for online instruction and student engagement, and a, a, a key component to actually the next two courses, actually all three, but the next two in particular, is to bring, again, some of these outside experts in to um, have, you know, webinars to understand and have question and answer sessions about what exactly is it like out there um, and what do you see and what do you find most helpful as you're um, delivering instruction, engaging students. Uh, a big focus on the appropriate use of technology in this course, um, how to differentiate instruction in a virtual classroom, um, which can be a challenge for, for folks who are new to it, even if you're very much a pro in your classroom. Um, doing this in a virtual environment can pose some challenges. Um, it's a lot more focused on the differentiation than it, than it is in a regular classroom. Um, and so one of the things that you become very dependent on is data. And so we also start to incorporate data here in the instructional strategies course and really blow it out more in the performance assessment course. But how do you focus on data analysis and what is that role, the role of that data in differentiating instruction? Um, what are some of the skills that you need to have to be able to identify and analyze um, student needs and gaps? And um, this was a big one, a big emphasis with the, with the advisory committee because, again, as hiring managers, we all see that this <clears throat> can be, in some cases, um, um, I wouldn't want to say the make or break, but it's definitely a, a, huge, a huge selling point for uh, an incumbent candidate and also for somebody who's on the job to be able to use data well. Um, to inform their next step. Um, 
we also are really going to expand in instructional strategies beyond the K to 14 um, educational environment to expose um, expose you to techniques used in other industries. Um, again, my background is in corporate. Um, prior to working for K-12 for eight years, I was in I was at Hewlett Packard in their corporate education department. You know, testing out all kinds of new technologies for education and um, uh, worked in many startups, and so there, a lot of us have those kinds of experiences that we can bring to bear on on this and on this industry and on this environment. That um, in a lot of in a lot of ways, some of the um, some of the areas that you would potentially work for, some of the schools or districts, they're very new to this. Um, so we want to bring some of that to bear. Um, in performance assessment in the virtual classroom, we're going to be talking about some of the myths and myths because there are a lot, and, and challenges, uh, real challenges of assessing performance virtually. Uh, we're going to be looking at valid measures of performance at a distance. Um, how do you really master that? For some folks, um, you know, back in the day, I'd say it's probably changing now, but back in the day, one of the biggest, you know, block, blockades that we had with K-12, for example, setting up a virtual school in a state was um, just a simple pushback that people said, how do you know that student is the one that you're, you know, the student that you've been working with the whole month is the one that's taking the test. So how do we how do we develop some valid measures of performance and, and overcome that hurdle? How to effectively monitor and assess performance, modify instructional practices using data um, to guide you, and um, develop some of those actual tools that you need. So, um, and then a final push with it here is to really focus. There's a big focus with um, organizations such as Connections K12 and others on really tying teacher competencies and performance directly to student performance. And they do that. They actually do that. And so how, what that means for you, what you need to be thinking about, what you need to be working on, and, um, uh, and how, to really, how to really implement some of those skills. And then finally, the practicum. We're very excited about the practicum, um, which isn't going to be offered until next year. And you saw the timeline there. but. Um, um, and this is something that's still evolving too, but we've got a, you know great exposure through the board to um, um, partner organizations who are helping us along in this area. That it's really an opportunity to demonstrate your skills and knowledge gained through the, sort of the um, certificate program. Uh, we've got incorporated in there some peer teaching, some shadowing. Hopefully, if we can, um, you know, depending on which organizations we're able to partner with, um, shadowing of, of actual teachers in the field. Um, so little mini um, exposure to that. Uh, we've got you designing curriculum. We've got you using data and feedback to manage delivery. You're actually going to be teaching these courses. So um, we're very excited about that practicum and hope that you all can sort of hang with us until we get there. Uh, and I think that's it for me. So I will turn it over to Cindy. Thanks, guys. Hi. Can you hear me OK? Cindy, if you could just yes, speak up yes, a little bit. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, what was that? If you could speak up just a little bit. Oh, okay, no problem. Yeah, but other oh, than that, you're, you sound pretty clear. Oh, good, okay. Well, hi, I'm Cindy Carvajal, and I have the privilege of teaching the Foundations of Virtual Instruction course, so I just wanted to introduce myself as well as give an overview of the course content and format. Um, so when I started teaching at Capistrano Connections Academy about six years ago, Few people had experienced online higher education and fewer had even heard of online learning for students in K-12 through education. Um, professional development and training for teaching online was definitely learn as you go or on the job, basically figure it out yourself. So this program is an asset to the virtual teaching and greater education community as it enables educators to gain a foundation of information, connect with other professionals, and combine experience with that of others to continue building a vast database of best practices in virtual education. I've had the opportunity of being an online student through various programs and an online teacher in K-14 education and enjoy contributing to the advancement of K-14 online learning through sharing my experiences and learning from others. So um, do you wonder how a kindergartner can learn online, or a middle school student can learn math when not in the same room as the teacher, or how a high school student can prepare for and pass an AP class that's not offered at his or her local school? Well, the course will provide teachers, students, parents, 
and anyone interested in virtual education with a foundation of information and understanding virtual instruction. The objectives of the course cover a wide range of topics that will provide students with a foundation understanding in virtual instruction, including the ever-developing history of online learning and virtual instructional models, methods, and technologies. Participants in the course will learn about virtual education while experiencing it firsthand, both with synchronous and asynchronous methods. So the Founda Foundations course examines synchronous or live simultaneous learning through two scheduled sessions, one WebEx session like we're doing right now, and one online session using Adobe Connect Pro to enable par participants to experience two synchronous formats. If students are unable to attend the live sessions, or attend those sessions live, they will be recorded and they'll be able to review the recorded content later. Um, we'll also look at recorded synchronous sessions throughout the course topics that use Wimba and Illuminate platforms. We explore how these platforms can be used in K-14 virtual education, and some examples are in green on the screen there. UC Irvine also has a great tech support team who is available for assistance with the technology used in the course and program for um, any students participating that are new to this. Um, the learning and discovering of the Foundations course primarily will take place asynchronously, meaning separated by time and place, and um, it also explores asynchronous methods of instruction and their uses with K-14 students and topics. So through the course reading, supplemental resources, and discussions, the course creates an exhaustive list of technologies that can be used to support students with diverse learning styles and needs. On this slide, I've listed just a few of the resources that will be discussed for learning management systems e-learning resources, and the ever-exciting free and open source tools. That's just a few of them that will be covered in the course. Um, let's see, exploring models of virtual education and the technologies and platforms available for synchronous and asynchronous learning leads to course discussion and activities examining what is involved with transitioning from the traditional classroom to online teaching. We'll discuss what teaching techniques translate well to the online world and what strategies have to be adjusted. Participants in the Foundations course will also learn about basic issues regarding equity and access for K-14 students, learn about school funding and legal issues in virtual education, and participants will also come away from the course knowing what their role is regarding those issues. The Foundations course, like all UC, UC Irvine Extension courses, will use the Moodle Learning Management System for communication of assignments, readings, and discussions. That's a screenshot of um, that on the, on the slide there. Students will have a login and password to access the site and find all of the course information here. The first week of the course is an orientation week to get familiar with the format, and then there are 10 weeks following to explore the content. Each week, a selection of resources will be provided to explore, including podcast videos, websites, and research, and participants will reflect and discuss this material through discussions. An assignment will be due every other week to allow students to plan ahead around their schedules, and as mentioned previously, there will be two scheduled synchronous sessions during the course. Students who cannot attend those sessions live can view the recording. Uh, there are no required textbooks for this course, partially to save students some money, but also because there are many informative resources on the topics, and so the course lectures will pull together all the relevant information for the participants. So I've selected and compiled several web resources and current research articles, and students will be able to study further topics that are applicable and of interest to them. Um, information and lectures are prepared both as text and voice recorded PowerPoints for students' preferred learning style and easy reference, and I've also created a list of recommended books and supplemental resources that will be included. So that's a little bit about the overview of the course, and I think I'll turn it back over to Lisa now to take any questions or comments. 
Great. Thank you so much, Jonathan, Mary, um, and Cindy for presenting all of that great information. We are going to go ahead and spend the remaining time. We have a little over 10 minutes um, until the end of the webinar to take some questions from attendees. So if you think of a question, please submit it in the Q&A box. If you look at the top of the participant list on the right-hand side of the screen, you sh should see a row of icons. Press on the question mark icon and the Q&A panel will show up. Please feel free to submit questions there. If we aren't able to get to your question during the time allotted, please feel free to email me and I will forward it on to our presenters or use other resources we have here at Extension to try and get you an answer. So I left my email address on this slide. Um, if you have a question that you think of later on after the webinar ends, you can feel free to email it to me. And I'm going to go ahead and unmute all of the panelists currently that are logged in so that we can all kind of answer any questions. Um, you should all be able to see the Q&A panel, but I'll go ahead and, and verbally feed you the questions. Um, Mary, I think this first question is really right up your alley because you did have previous experience in the corporate world. So the question is, I know that we're discussing K-14 online instruction, but do you believe this type of training could be utilized in a large company, especially when it's geographically dispersed both nationally and internationally? Absolutely. Um, and that, you know, again, the, the focus of the course is on um, is really on, K, on the K to 14 realm. So if you're if you're interested in, in studying, um, you know, sort of what happens with use of technology in education and how it it um, is applicable in the K to 14 area, this this certificate program is probably more directly related to what you're looking for. But um, I think if you're um, interested you know, in, in sort of the industry and kind of where it's evolving beyond corporate, this is this is a good space for you. If you're looking for something that's more directed toward corporate education and how it's applied in a in a large company, um, I know that UC Irvine offers other courses that are more probably directly applicable to your interests. But um, you're going to see a lot of um, convergence between the fields and, um, you, know, d you know, in terms of exposure to the programs and, and where it's going and how people are using it, it, it could be helpful. Great. I hope that answered the question. And then also, I'm going to direct this question to Cindy and Jonathan um, because of their, their experience in act, working at an actual virtual school. Um, this attendee is asking about a child's social development. So since they are going to be taking a class fully online, for some individuals, if it's not a, a hybrid or blended learning environment, um, mm -hmm. what can you tell them about a child's social development? Cindy, do you want to start? Sure. Yeah, that's a great question. We hear that a lot um, from potential families looking into enrolling at our school um, and current families you know, worried about the same thing. A um, couple different responses to that. A lot of times a student who has the opportunity to learn online is able to use their education time more wisely. So rather than spending um, time in the classroom waiting for other students to lining up, waiting for everybody to put things away you know, quietly, they're able to, to um, get their education completed in fewer hours than they would be in a classroom. So they actually end up having more time to play outside with their neighbors afterwards or be involved with Girl Scouts or whatever community activities it is. So sometimes um, that's a good thing. Um, our, our program, um, depending on what kind of virtual school they're looking at, um, we also do offer organized field trips and have ways for students to connect with other students in the school um, asynchronously through the message boards and um, meet each other offline, make up certain play dates on their own um, that aren't official field trips. And then um, finally, through synchronous sessions like this, um, students are actually able to get to know their classmates in their school and know that there's other people doing the same thing that they're doing at the same time and communicate with each other that way too. So hopefully that kind of helps with it, with your question a little bit, but um, so there's a lot of different ways you think even though they're maybe at home or away from the social um, social avenues of the traditional classroom, they, they actually have a, a few other opportunities as well. So anything you, you want to add to that, Jonathan? Well, I, thank you, Cindy. That was great. I, I would say that what I, I would tell parents that, you know, by 3 o'clock, the, the neighborhood's back the way it was, whether the student went to public school, brick and mortar, whether they went to Catholic school, whether they went to, they were homeschooled, 
regardless of where they came from, by and the uh, student definitely has more experiences than that what goes on in a regular classroom. And I, you know, I just as a teacher, you know, there wasn't much time for interaction with students. Uh, it was before, you know, when you think about it, it's a little bit of time before school. Uh, since I was at high school, at different times during the day, but it didn't add up to a lot. In fact, what I would see walking around as principal. I, I, our teachers were talking to students all day long, and I think they had much more interaction. And uh, and then, with as, as Cindy said, with the message boards with other students, students had great opportunities for field trips. And I often saw uh, down in Dana Point our kids with their parents during the middle of the day going to the uh, Ocean Institute or something that, that, as Cindy said, because they were freed from the time constraints of being in a classroom, they had time to orchestrate their lives and do even more. So, I, and our, at our picnics that had, you know, 700, 800, I just didn't see any socially uh, handicapped students there. Actually, this is Mary. I am going to jump in on this one real quick because one of the things that um, I think we tend to forget is that, um, especially if you, as you start looking at the older grades, um, how are kids interacting? socially right now. They're texting. <laughs> They're using their cell phones. They're on Facebook. Um, just look at the social network. If you haven't seen the movie, it's a great movie. But um, it, one of the things that I think that provides a real advantage um, to the kids who participate in these programs, especially as they get older, because there are a lot of questions about whether or not you should send your middle school or high school to, to a virtual program. What is that going to do for them socially, um, academically at that age? Um, is to really look at how it becomes a model for how to communicate effectively uh, from a distance, um, which is where a lot of sort of the trending is happening. And this is where when I was some of what I, what I was talking about earlier about the technology is kind of pushing us into these areas and we don't know how to deal with them. Um, this is a really good example of how um, the social aspects of what can happen online can be used in a really productive way. Great. Great. Those are all great answers. Um, one other question, for K-12 education, do most virtual teachers teach one content area, or do they cover multiple areas? That's a good question. I would say yes. <laughs> um, that both. I would say yes. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm an elementary teacher currently, um, and I teach fourth and fifth grade, focusing on the gifted math, science, and language arts, so that's kind of a couple areas. I think even middle school and um, secondary teachers tend to, even if it's just one subject, they may have a couple different um, classes of that subject, a couple different levels of language arts or something like that too. Um, Jonathan or Mary? I think the only time uh, you see teachers teaching a little more than one subject is in a, very, in a startup school where they don't have lots of teachers, but typically that gives way to people who get to focus in on Things that they feel better equipped to teach. All of our teachers were highly qualified, only in areas. But you know, sometimes in the start of school, you you need bodies, and uh, you know, it's like a school on the prairie. You do, you do many things to many ages. Yeah, and I just, I mean, from other industry areas, it really depends. It depends on who you're going to end up working for um, and what their needs are. Sometimes, yeah, you're you're going broad, and sometimes you're going deep. Um, and at K-12, they would hire K-5 teachers and expect you to have, you know, just like in an elementary school, you know, be flexible somewhat with kind of where you're placed. But um, you could be also, if you end up working for a tutoring company, you could be tutoring different subjects. Um, right. So it just kind of depends on where you land. Right. That also leads me into another question, and I think we've already addressed it. Um, this individual is retired from classroom teaching, but is tutoring online for a company. Um, so this certificate program would be of benefit to that individual because, um, as Mary mentioned on her slide earlier, online or phone-based tutoring is another avenue of virtual teaching. I don't know if, Mary, you wanted to add anything else to that question. Well, yeah, sure. Um, you know, online tutoring is actually a way that I've found a lot of teachers kind of sort of segue into the field. You know, it's a really good um, way to um, start a, a virtual teaching career. And, um, you know, if that's where you're going or if, you know, if it's something to supplement what you're doing, I, I'd say if anything, it's going to just give you some real exposure to, to where the industry is going as a whole, because even tutoring itself is evolving so much, um, you know, from online and, or from phone based to online to different tools to, you know, mobile, mobile technologies. I'm developing a mobile app right now that has, has to deal with that and incorporate some of that. So, um, 
you know, I think I think if anything, it's going to just keep you abreast of the industry, which is why which is why the certificate program was kind of created in the first place, is to keep people fresh. Okay, and then one last question: um, Do online teachers still need to have the proper credentials for the state they're located in? And then, if you could just give a general background of how virtual schools are are accredited or tied to to the state that um, they are or the district that they're located in. Hmm. Good question. Uh, I, I can start off. The uh, online in for Texas Academy, they were they were uh, credentialed in the state that they were that the school physically resided in. Although um, there was, uh, there they were able students are able to take typically a, the board policy for particular districts allows students to take courses up to maybe two classes, ten units outside of the outside. So that allows them to take courses from typically uh, our students locally in Southern California would take University of Missouri for their uh, health or BYU and so on. So there's a certain amount that don't require an, an accredential person. And um, um, I'm sorry, I didn't, the last part of your question, Lisa? Um, just how virtual schools are accredited, are accredited? and how yeah. they're tied. Yeah, uh, there, we uh, Campus Toronto Connections Academy was WASC approved, same public school accreditation agency that, that accredits every school in California. Got a six-year review. Uh, other states use don't use WASC; they use some, uh, they use uh, other CETA and some other agencies. But uh, if it's a public school, they're they're still doing it that way. Private and other online don't re don't require that. Okay, Cindy and Mary, did you have any other comments before we wrap up this session today? Nothing yet. I've just um, we're really excited about it, and we hope that you guys are too. <laughs> That's all. It'll be a great program. Great, Jonathan. Did you have any other comments? No, I just I, like I said. I think uh, as you were as you were talking, I think um, you know I, the last two people I hired had tutoring experience. And um, as someone who hired a lot of people in the last couple of years, uh, this, this program would have, as I've said it for three times, but it would have looked very good on a resume. Uh, and I'm very impressed with, with the way the UCI program has, uh, has gotten this concept together. And uh, it's going to be a great program. Great. We're looking forward to it, too. I hope you all enjoyed this webinar and gained some insight into the current field of online teaching, as well as UCI Extension's Virtual Teacher Certificate Program. Hopefully you will enroll in the first course of the program, which again begins March 28th, and we hope that you will consider adding our fully online certificate program to your credentials. Um, this slide has my contact information. Let me go ahead and move to the last slide. It has my contact information as well as my directors, so feel free to contact us with any questions. And again, if we weren't able to get to a question or you think of one after this webinar, um, please feel free to shoot me an email message. Thank you again to our panel, and have a great day, everyone.